By my watch, it is now five past, so we're underway here for the second session of the second day of Legal Ed Con. A very warm welcome back to the sessions. Um, this one will run for the next hour or so on how law courses are proving their value. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by a panel of experts. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Thank you very much for joining me and giving up your time this afternoon. Um, if you're just joining us as well, make sure that you interact. We've got the Q&A section on the right-hand side and the chat function. So as the speakers are delivering their talks, feel free to pop in your uh, questions in there and we'll come to them during the Q&A. Um, but yeah, I think um, the appropriate place to start is just, we'll just crack on with the, crack on with both the introductions and the talks. And by my list, I think it's Tom Brooks, Dean of Durham University Law School, who's up first. So Tom, it's over to you. And it's a great joy to, to be here. I, I always like uh, supporting Legal Cheek, however and whenever uh, I can. And thank you for this opportunity. Um, I want to um, say a, a few words. You know, working in a in a law school that's at least geographically in Europe, if not uh, Euro European in other ways, uh, but also coming from uh, uh, from America, uh, to say something about um, where I think the value is, and it has something to do with. What I have to say are, are kind of two competing visions that I think I see on each side of the pond, as, as we say. Um, the first thing to say is that I, I think that when people think about uh, what is the purpose of a law school, how to how to do programs, show value, often we refer to, or often people can refer to, uh, one of two visions. The first I call the Bologna model, named after the oldest law school, um, Bologna, where studying law was a university qualification. It was, it was about getting a qualification. It was very scholarly, very scholastic. That was the purpose. And, and that's what you did. You, you got a qualification. And that kind of way of doing things in an ivory tower, as it were, as sometimes it's negatively called, uh, but kind of the scholarly pursuits of law is this kind of a venerable model and, and, it, and it fits some places maybe better uh, than others. But that's one kind of vision. And sometimes you hear but people want to move away from that, but that's, you know, they're, they're betraying the, the real purpose, the real drive, the, the real uh, object of, 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 of study of law, which is an academic um, uh, practice uh, primarily, if not uh, more than that. I'm delighted to hear other Americans are in the, in the crowd. Uh, hello, brothers and sisters. Uh, the other uh, vision uh, that I think is out there, broadly speaking, I'm speaking crudely. I've got five minutes, maybe less right now. So I apologize for cutting corners. I can say more if people wanted to know more. It's what I call the Litchfield model, as opposed to Bologna. And in Litchfield, uh, in my part of the woods, the state of Connecticut, I'm from New Haven, about a 40 minutes or so away is what was Litchfield Law School, America's first law school before other universities had set up in, 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 in a revolutionary America. And Litchfield's purpose was not qualifications. You did not get a qualification. You did not, it wasn't part of a university. It was a some bloke's lounge uh, who was a very <laughs> a very experienced listener. Uh, and if you couldn't get a good apprenticeship or you wanted something extra to get that better job, including what, two vice presidents, future vice presidents uh, did, including Aaron Burr, famous for the whole Hamilton uh, dual situation, um, is you, you went to him and for a fee, he taught you, using Blackstone's commentaries of the law of England, um, taught you all the different areas of law. And the purpose was to make you a lawyer wasn't to make you qualifications, wasn't to help you learn to build rockets or, or, or do other things. It was to be practicing law. And that, that model in the US, of course, is very heavy there, where most law schools, as a graduate school, often with a great degree of autonomy from the rest of the university, uh, are often places of uh, taught by lawyers, for lawyers, <laughs> or future lawyers, and, it, and it's more practice uh, based. And again, these, 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 these thoughts are often to be intention. Are we supposed to be serving you know, people to become lawyers and, and, and follow the, the market in that sense and, and career focused and all those other things in that kind of narrow, more professional kind of way? Or is there something different uh, of this kind of academic study? Is it to be studied like a philosophy degree, history degree, other degrees? It's a degree program and this other thing is, 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 is dirty or should be avoided or, or, or things like this. Now, I disagree. Uh, with that. And I think you know, the best law schools can see this uh, align. You, you see this, I think, with, with virtually all the, the top ranked uh, schools. I won't name any, so I don't get myself in trouble with anyone on or off the list. Um, but you see this kind of everywhere where you have this kind of mixture 
of both teaching people about uh, you know, the, the, the essentials of, of, of working in practice as an essential thing of what we do, but doing more than that and going somewhere. It's not just about uh, teaching up to some standard, not just, dare I say it, uh, just, just doing SQE. Do the SQE well, that's enough. It's not enough because everyone's got to do that. <laughs> to practice, all the students are going to have to uh, do that. If you're only uh, aiming at that, your students are going to fall behind and it's going to be damaging to them. The opportunities will be limited. So one point would be to say these things align. There's a wonderful essay by my good friend Heather Gherkin uh, in my hometown in New Haven, uh, Dean of Yale, about how the theory school, I think it was in Harvard Law Review, um, uh, at Yale, how they bring to get these things together. And I think that that's true of lots of other top places too. And, and it's not a incompatibility. But my final minute, I want to also throw in a, a final thought that that is also not enough. So often how we get, we think about law schools. Is it about academic study? Is it about aiming towards uh, uh, practice? Yes, these things can come aligned. Not many uh, law schools think enough about, I think, how that can be done in some kind of deeper way. But the problem remains that most of what we all do in that, and I throw my hands up, same here uh, in, in the glory uh, that is the, the Cathedral City of Durham, same here, most of what we do is uni-jurisdictional. It is kind of looking at one jurisdiction, um, teaching our students to practice law wherever we find ourselves, whatever country we happen to be in. Or to go beyond that, something about international law. I noticed the polls say something about international law but not talking about global uh, legal education, not talking about uh, that, you know, learning about the law of England and Wales as a good thing for students to be uh, know about, but also to be exposed if they, to the law of the United States, uh, to China, uh, in, in, in those two places uh, in particular. Uh, it's not just city law firms, it's not just London law firms, it's not just London and Birmingham law, law firms, it's lots of law firms, it's maybe all of them, are working across jurisdictions. And our students, I think, if you're, if you're only uh, getting some exposure to your own jurisdiction primarily or something on international law, that will limit uh, opportunities uh, that they can do in the law or outside uh, the law. And so I think that the you know, way we show our value is to not only be focused on academics, but to do that too, to not only be focused on serving the needs of, uh, and to addressing you know, where the states of the legal sector is, though we should do that too, um, but to go beyond that and to look to incorporate other, some exposure to other key legal systems in our education, in our curriculum, like the United States or other parts of North America, I don't want to upset the Canadians, and also uh, China as well, things like this, because that is what the future, I think, is. Thanks very much for that, Tom. Thanks for getting things underway. I would like to now hand over to Elizabeth. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. So I'm having a healthy dose of imposter syndrome here, um, as I am not from a university or a law school. And although I was a solicitor, I did not do a law degree, I did a zoology degree. And I also did the very last year of the Law Society finals. Um, so I have no experience of what the modern law school looks like in the 21st century. I can only judge it on what it was like back in the 90s. Um, and when I reflect on that, I think what I, the, the sort of studying for the common professional exam and then the Law Society finals was literally like doing, you know, 15 O levels in a year. And it was very much about learning the material and regurgitating it. And that was pretty much what you had to do in order to pass. And I know it's evolved hugely since then. But speaking about it from the perspective of where we are at Law Care, so we're a charity that support and promote mental health and well-being in the legal profession. Um, and particularly in light of, um, you know, the evolving world of work and the impact of COVID, which has been seismic, um, not only in the legal sector, but across all sectors. Um, you know, from my understanding of a traditional law degree, which may not be like that, quite like it is, like it is now as it was in the past, is, you know, a lot of that is about learning the law developing those skills of critical thinking and analysis and reasoning and being able to be prudent, assimilating information. I was in a webinar the other day with a family law group resolution and a very experienced family lawyer said, you know, only about 20% of my job is actually about the law. 80% of it is about relationships, 
with clients and colleagues. And I thought that was a really interesting point. And I think there's a growing recognition now that those legal skills that perhaps you develop through formal legal education and training are useful, but there's also a bunch of other skills that in order to be a successful practitioner in the in the current legal workplace, and I'm, I'm very much talking about this in terms of people studying law who are going down that pathway to becoming a lawyer, um, developing those people and collaboration skills are really important. Uh, as I understand it, the rise of technology and artificial intelligence, a lot of that black letter law stuff is going to be a given. Um, you're going to be able to look the law up. It's about how you apply it. And when it comes to practice, any client in front of you wants to look at a human being rather than a computer and feel that person, I trust them, I trust their judgment, they understand where I'm coming from, they're communicating well with me, I feel they've got my back. Um, so those sorts of human skills around empathy and understanding and collaboration and communication are going to be really important. And I think that's an opportunity within law school to start developing some of those skills. Sure, a lot of that also comes from practice, but I think being aware that those skills are really important. And I think a reflection that I have from speaking over the years in my role at law care with a number of students, and I've spoken to undergraduates at some of the top law schools, is also quite a competitive edge within law schools. There's a quite a lot of pointy elbows and less collaboration and sense of we're in this together. And I think building that sense of not always having pointy elbows, pointy elbows and how you can work with others is an important skill to have in the 21st century workplace. Another area just to touch on is around ethics. And particularly for, for junior lawyers in practice, we've had a lot of cases in, well, not quite, quite a few cases now in England and Wales of junior solicitors who've been struck off for making mistakes that they, they hasn't, wasn't making the mistake that got them into difficulty. It was covering it up and lying about it. And I think helping people coming through the profession in the early stages of their careers, recognizing what good behavior looks like in the workplace and what good behavior and ethical values are for lawyers is really important. And I'm not so sure that we teach that very well uh, in the UK. Certainly my memory of law school, and it may have changed and forgive me if I'm wrong, you know, the ethics we were taught was about fair dodging. If you didn't pay your tube fare, it wasn't about what happens if you leave a briefcase on a train with important documents in it that are confidential. And I think having those real world examples is important. And then finally, is some of those great thinking styles of lawyers like critical thinking and reasoning and prudence. Uh, if you don't manage some of those well, they can have a negative impact on your mental health. And I think helping people come into the profession to understand better their, psycholog their psychology, how they think, how they approach things, and recognizing when those habits may not be healthy could be really important to help people with their skill set of actually managing the, the life and, you know, what life is really like in the law. Hugely rewarding, but it can be hugely demanding. So I think I'm sort of coming at it from a perspective of having a more holistic approach to the realities of the skill set and what life is like in the law for those students that are heading into practice. Thanks very much for that, Elizabeth. Uh, next up is Christopher O'Connor, Head of Segment Marketing at LexisNexis. Hi, thanks, Tom, and thank, thanks, Legal Chief, for having us back. Always love to speak at, um, at Legal Chief events. I'm really glad Elizabeth said that she had imposter syndrome because you can only imagine what I'm feeling. I'm not even a lawyer. Uh, so uh, so <laughs> you're, you're certainly not alone there, Elizabeth. Um, but I'm, I, I'm going to try and answer the, the question uh, that we've got in our topic today head on. How do law courses prove their value in today's market? And I think in a word, that's employability. Uh, the context for this is, um, so my team at LexisNexis, the segment marketing team, do, do most of our research into the legal market. And we've got a report coming out later this summer, which I think will be a brilliant interest. And uh, we'll actually put the put a link in the chat afterwards if you want to sign up to receive that report when it comes. But basically what it's looking at is the impact of, of COVID and the crisis we see on the sector. And LexisNexis, given we're a big, bigger player, an important player in the legal market, but we're not a provider, it means that we can kind of sit a little bit on the sidelines and do real analysis and make sometimes quite you know, thought-provoking and challenging observations. But the, the good news is this time, which is going to be a really positive observation, and we're going to tell a really positive story for the legal education sector. Um, it's obviously been a challenging time for universities. You don't need me to tell you that. And we are going to try and put some numbers on that and quantify exactly what the impact has been, but it's obviously enormous. 
But we do believe that law degrees can be the savior of the, of the higher education sector. And we think law degrees can be a real source of growth for universities, which is obviously good, good news for everyone in this room. And we think that proving your value through employability um, can, can, be the, can be the silver bullet here and can really help you save that. So why do we think that? Um, we think that both on the demand side and the supply side, law courses are going to see growth. Um, on the demand side, we've done some analysis looking at historical recessions. And one thing we found is that at times of economic crisis, students tend to flock to vocational subjects and law above all others. Uh, we talk a lot about in our community about the challenge of getting jobs and employability. But believe me, like I, I did politics and philosophy at university. It can be worse. <laughs> so I think lots of students see law as a safe haven with really solid job prospects. And that is actually borne out by some of the outcomes data and some of the lifetime earnings data. So demand is going to grow, and, and universities need to be ready to capture some of that. On the supply side, that's really good news for universities and providers. If there's growing demand, it means there should be the opportunity to grow places at your courses, to add new courses, and ultimately capture more income for your universities. The final point of, of this on the supply side is that the profitability, profitability of law courses is very good. Now, it's a little bit of a dirty word, I think, sometimes. But actually, law courses are cheaper to provide than lots of STEM subjects. So the case you can make as law students, as law faculty, and law course providers, is that law courses are great for universities and there should be a place for expansion and growth. Um, but really, to, to take advantage of those trends, employability is the silver bullet. Um, we, we, we're doing analysis to show that employability is increasing in the rankings algorithms. So it's more and more important for you to get to the top of those listings. Students are also even more demanding of it. Um, well, there's lots of survey data on this. It's one of the main things that students look for. I can see very happily that's borne out by our poll that's running in the background as we're talking, where employability is coming out on top of the things that students ask for. So it's clear that students want it. Um, but universities are starting to respond to that and they are starting to focus. And there's a real chance for universities to differentiate on this factor, to demonstrate their value to students, to win market share, to add places by demonstrating that they can help them with employability and outcomes. And whether that is collaborations between the law school and other departments, whether that's really innovative practices, I think the last legal liberty event I was, I was at, someone from Aberdeen University was talking about how they taught scrum methodology to law students in anticipation of the fact they'll need to be good at product management and product building when they're going to practice. So all sorts of innovative practice, practices like that. So do, do look out for that piece of research and we hope that will be of interest. What does this mean for you? And I'll try and really quickly cycle through the different people who are probably in the room. For students, what does this mean? It means that you're consumers in a competitive market and you need to be more demanding. And that might be a bit challenging for some of the people on this call who are on the other side of the equation, but you do have that market power and that market power is going to grow. And the, the bad news is that you know, there's increasing competition in the jobs market and law. And actually, the SQE is going to really fundamentally change that and for a good reason. It's going to lower barriers to entry for non traditional applicants. And those non traditional applicants generally have much better work experience and they generally have better employability skills, certainly than fresh graduates. So you need to be demanding of your courses in terms of employability outcomes. For those providers, for the faculty, for the librarians, the information managers, hopefully this is really good news. You're probably feeling some budget pressure at the moment. Universities are struggling. That's probably coming through to you. The good news is we hope that we can provide an evidence base to say, this is not the place to cut. This is the place to grow. Invest in employability. Invest in the resources, the tools we need. Um, and we can win, we can win, and we can make more money for the university, we can add students and, and, and add places. And that's the same message for course leaders. There's a big prize here. If you, if you get this right, you can grow your law courses, but you need to put employability at the heart of the value you provide. So hopefully that's interesting, maybe a little bit challenging. I'd love to continue the debate, both in the Q&A and afterwards. Do come to our stand with LexisNexis, and look out for that link to register for the report when it comes out this summer. Thank you very much for that, Christopher. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Matthew Tomlinson, Dean of the University of Law, Leeds and Sheffield campus. Thank you very much, Tom. And I will just um, give you the heads up. I have had a little bit of connectivity issues. I've been kicked out twice, but hopefully it is going to hold um, good for me now. So what I really wanted to discuss today was how value, I suppose, can be achieved in the era of SQE through partnerships. and. It's really interesting to, to, to listen to um, colleagues on, on the call talk about obviously all the activity from their institutions and how obviously they're defining value in their own areas. And from many of the conversations that I certainly have had with universities over the past few years, it's um, 
clear that every institution is looking to define its own value in the new era of SQE and how they're achieving this is, is differing, you know, from, from one institution to the next. Um, law programmes, as Chris was saying, they've consistently increased in popularity over recent years and the market um, for pers prospective students is bigger um, than it ever has been. And within this market, we've got distinct profiles of students and they identif identify um, value in different ways from their law degree. And what law schools have done um, and what we're hearing is that they've built and developed their programmes around the profiles of students they're wanting to attract. And they've invested a lot of time and resources in, in doing that. And you know, over the past 10 years, if we look back, you know, we've seen a real diversification in the types of LLB programme available to students and universities have defined the value of those programmes um, in, in different ways. As I said, you know, traditional universities are uh, retaining a firm focus on the delivery of, you know, academically focused programmes, um, often, you know, with this renowned specialism in a certain area of law. Um, other universities have used the opportunity to introduce more practical based LLBs and you know speaking you know from you law uh, we've enjoyed you know huge success in that arena. Um, clinical law modules um, are now increasing in popularity amongst prospective students when selecting the, the, the courses that they're looking at. Um, in addition to you know all, all the other um, things some of which have been covered like employability provision, transferable skills, um, you know international links, um, amongst other things. And I suppose my point is that every provider of an LLB has invested significantly in creating um, a unique and compelling programme for um, the students that they're wishing to attract. And really the, the arrival of SQE presents, I suppose, somewhat of a, of a crossroad for universities in terms of how they continue to represent value and how those programmes represent value when um, the qualifying law degree status, I suppose, is, is effectively removed by SQE. And where the LLB is no longer a prerequisite to go on to a professional stage of training and, and now sit the SQE, I think it's posed a question um, with a lot of law schools about whether they should be adapting their programmes to incorporate SQE 1 preparation to enable students so to be able to effectively sit an SQE 1 assessment at the end of their course. And would that then reflect true value for money? Well. The, the reality is that it's only viable for certain universities to do that. And whilst it might enhance the value of those universities' LLB programmes for the majority of institutions to adopt um, that kind of model of embedding an SQE1 content would actually compromise the value of, of their, their programmes, the, the freedom of, of having enhanced their, their degree programmes um, in, in the ways that we've obviously heard and, and have articulated a moment ago um, would obviously have to be compromised to, to accommodate that additional content. So in order to effectively prepare students for SQE 1, um, what I think you need is a faculty who are both skilled and motivated to teach practically focused um, syllabus and also to teach to an MCQ exam. And if you're looking to, to, to marry the two up, I think this is where you know the partnership model really um, does have merit. So the I suppose the point I, I, I'm coming to is that I believe that law schools should really kind of keep true to their own identity and, and master them. If you've got a degree programme, you know, which you have developed um, you know, through rich academic content, you've you know, d delivered um, your programme with expert faculty, you've created optional modules that give students the freedom to explore, you know, areas of law that are really of interest to them. Um, you know, you've developed employability um, opportunities, you've got links to um, overseas institutions, then actually, you know, question whether you are, I, I suppose, really well positioned to, to, to um, deliver that SQE content. And I think you can't define value by being a jack of all trades either and I think what's truly valuable to a student in the area of SQE and what will actually be felt by a student um, in their um, LLB provision is, is, is where um, you are effectively uniting experts in their own um, respective fields. So you law um, and, and obviously speaking from, from um, our perspective and, and from, from where I'm sat, you know, we have a long-standing reputation of excellence in professional legal training. We've been able to invest and innovate in state-of-the-art learning technology and data analytics that give 
you know, our faculty, I suppose the, the best tools to prepare students for SQE examinations, that type of assessment. Um, we've got a range of courses on offer to students who would want to go on to do um, an SQE. And they range from preparation courses all the way through to full SQE masters, which have additional um, elective content and, and a skills focus to prepare a student for the workplace. And our faculty are former practitioners. They've got that experience in terms of professional training um, and have been um, trained in how to obviously deliver specifically for the type of assessment, which is SQE. So I suppose where our SQE programmes can sit at the end of a university programme, um, it really, enables I think an institution to truly exploit its own expertise and capability and it's I believe a very powerful and compelling offer to um, students. We've had enormous success in this field today we've established seven satellite campuses um, in Reading, Exeter, Norwich, um, Liverpool, Sheffield, Chester and, and, uh, and, and Newcastle now and having led on, on two of these so Sheffield and Newcastle which fall into my territory I can really see how attractive this is to the prospective student going to those host universities LLB programs because the whole legal education journey is offered at the same location um, and where both University of Law and the host um, institution have their kind of excellency and, and, and they can demonstrate that to the students in their respective fields you've got this continuous journey um, from obviously year one of the LLB through if the student wishes to doing the, the kind of professional stage of their exams and whilst we both deliver obviously our own respective courses there's massive scope for collaboration which I think further enriches the host university's LLB program um, and the students obviously benefit from that directly and in terms of obviously collaborations with universities and, and the ability to partner uh, in that way we don't exclusively I, I suppose operate a, a kind of satellite partnership model we also have a significant number of progression partners and in those instances it's mostly where we obviously are geographically proximate so there's, there's no sense in having a, a satellite operation but the same principle effectively applies and we effectively the, the SQE provider um, we dovetail the program of our partner um, institution and students that join that partners LLB have that clear pathway to qualification with the expert provision um, in both the academic LLB and then obviously where ULaw sits in terms of the professional training for the exams. Um, I think importantly as well students have a choice as well they don't have to have made that decision at the outset of embarking on the LLB uh, they have that freedom to explore um, their LLB program to the full and then have the ability to continue there after should they wish um, so I think to, to conclude you know whilst I recognize that it's not going to be of course attractive to, to every institution to have um, a kind of partnership approach to, to SQE I think there is uh, significant merit for many to, to, to look at it um, and to my mind you know it does truly achieve value for a student um, and universities you know that are embracing this partnership model I think I think they're able to demonstrate um, you know very clearly to students that there is that clear trajectory and pathway um, to obviously um, the, the kind of professional vocational um, part of their um, career so um, if anyone who's listening would like to know more about that um, please do get in touch with me but I think that um, concludes all I had to say I'll hand back to Tom. Thank you very much Matthew for those insights and um, I'd now like to hand over to the Director of Careers and Employability at Birmingham Law School which is part of the University of Birmingham, uh, Paul McConnell. Thank you very much Tom and hello everyone it's great to be here. So my role as Director of Careers and Employability is very much connected to the idea of how we provide value to our students. But actually when I first joined Birmingham around three years ago I took on the role of Head of Education which means that I was responsible for curriculum development and I joined just at a time when we were undertaking a curriculum review both in light of the SQE and also other developments in higher education and very much embarking on this journey that we've heard others talk about questioning what Birmingham Law School wanted to be and how we could best provide value to our students. What we recognise very early on as Matt was saying is that value can 
us quite a lot of different aspects and will mean different things to different people. To give some insights in relation to Birmingham Law School, we're one of the largest law schools in terms of our undergraduate population. We take on, on average, around 500 undergraduate students into year one every year. And it's a highly diverse cohort. Considering how we could provide value to that cohort, we identified that there were three broad groups of students who choose to come to Birmingham. First of all, we've got those who are seeking to work in the legal profession in the UK predominantly as solicitors in England. Secondly, we've got those who are seeking international legal careers. We have many international students at Birmingham Law School, but equally increasing numbers of our British students are interested in international careers and are very attracted by international legal markets like Dubai and New York, for example. Thirdly, we've got that large group of students who are doing a law degree but not with the final intention of pursuing a legal career. They see it as a launch pad to another area of developing their, their professional life in the future. And it was important for all of us in that curriculum review to try and achieve value for all of those different groups of students, whatever their goals. And the proposition we came up with was really a very simple one. It was just that, that whatever a student wanted to do, a Birmingham law degree should position them well for that goal. There's a lot of employability aspects within that, but equally academic elements as well. That obviously has a link to the curriculum, but also the extracurricular aspects. So I'll now touch on what we're doing, both in terms of curricular and extracurricular elements. Turning first to the curriculum, we've launched our new curriculum this academic year, unfortunately coinciding with the general challenges within higher education and it has been very well received by students, this idea of a broad curriculum that equips them well for whatever they want to do. And it is designed to speak to all of the different groups of students that I just referenced. As in many law schools, there's a strong focus on transferable skills. So rather than so much focus on black letter law, we're looking at research skills so that students can effectively access the law looking at strong analytical and problem solving skills and also high level written skills. But thinking about the three groups of students that I identified, for those students that want to pursue careers as solicitors, linking to Matt's comments, we're not seeking to be an organisation that fully prepares students for the SQE, but we help them on that journey through the experiences and skills that they develop through their LLB. In particular for those students who do want to pursue the SQE, on a number of core and optional modules, we've introduced multiple choice elements so that students can start to develop those skills of answering multiple choice questions ready for the SQE. For those students who are interested in international legal careers, we've developed our International Pathways to Practice programmes, whereby for a whole range of different jurisdictions, we offer additional tuition and insights on legal practice in those particular countries. To give one example, tomorrow we're launching a new Pathway to Practice India programme for students who maybe are interested in qualifying in India, but equally students who might be looking to work in a global law firm which is doing work in India. And as part of that Pathway to Practice India programme, we've partnered with an elite Indian law school to offer additional classes around particularly Indian business law and Indian business culture to our students, as well as employability insights from leading legal industry figures from India. Finally, turning to the students who aren't looking to pursue a legal career, we've ensured that the programme really prepares them well for that through the embedding of employability skills. We've also got a number of quite innovative modules which are only legal in the loosest sense. To give one illustration, we have a fantastic core year two module called Legal Communications, which was developed by my colleague Emma Flint, who was actually awarded the Oxford University Press Law Teacher of the Year Award just a few weeks ago, based on her work in that module. And it looks at communicating about law in non-academic ways, including professional writing, legal journalism, she looks at art and law. There's a whole range of different legal communication skills that that module develops, which will be really valuable for all of the students. So it's a diverse curriculum for all students. And then on top of that, we've got a really strong extracurricular provision. At Birmingham Law School, we were lucky that a few years ago, the university set up something called Kepler, 
which is the Centre for Professional Legal Education and Research, and sitting alongside the academic functions of the Russell Group Law School is this group of people like myself, who are former practitioners, who deliver really strong, organised employability content for our students. That includes many pro bono advocacy opportunities, which covers mooting, interviewing, negotiation, debating, and finally, employability, which is the area that I head up. So just to give a feel for what we do on employability. This year has actually been quite surprising in that we found that employability has been stronger than ever, despite the challenges of the pandemic. So every week we have a structured programme of careers training sessions for our students, which they can participate in on a voluntary basis. And those are themed weeks. So, for example, we have weeks around researching legal careers, weeks around applying for roles, weeks on interview technique, weeks on international careers for our students with international intentions. And throughout the year, there is this cohesive programme. And it's great to see many of the law firms that we partner with on that programme actually here today participating in this conference. On top of the speaker events, we have a large programme of placements. In the year before the pandemic, we arranged over 100 exclusive work experience placements for students from Birmingham Law School with our partner employers across all different areas of legal practice. And whilst there have been some challenges with that in the pandemic, we're pleased to say that many of those placements have moved successfully online. And also we've succeeded in developing on the back of that a number of international placements to support our students with international careers intentions, which we might not have been so easily able to do in the situation that existed before the pandemic. So in summary, drawing it together, I'd say that at Birmingham, we're certainly focused on the academic aspect as an academic Russell Group Law School, but making sure that that's as applicable as possible to all of our students, whatever their intentions. And then that's supported with a really strong careers and employability program through Kepler. I hope it's been interesting to hear a bit more about what we offer and I very much look forward to discussion in the Q&A session. Thanks very much for that, Paul. And finally, I'd like to hand over to the Director of Policy and Regulation at the Legal Services Board, Chris Nichols. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, yep, I'm Director of Policy at the LSB. Uh, so I'm a regulator and the LSB is the oversight regulator for legal services. So I'm going to give a slightly different perspective to the speakers we've heard from already. So one of the LSB's statutory functions is to decide whether to approve proposed changes to any of the frontline regulators rules and regulations. So we had the job of deciding whether to approve the SRA's SQE framework when it was um, when it was just a proposal. And we eventually did approve that in October last year um, after securing a number of commitments from the SRA. So I'm going to focus my few minutes here on the value that I think law courses can provide to the sector, um, but also to wider society when it comes to the crucial goal of building a more diverse and inclusive legal profession. So as you'd expect, one of the key strands of our assessment of the SQE application focused on the impact or potential impact on diversity and inclusion. Uh, and in our assessment, we came across some really concerning evidence on how the current framework is letting down certain groups through some really big differences in attainment. The, the, the most stark example isn't from LLB law degrees, um, but it's one that the SRA provided on, L, on the LPC, and I think it's worth sharing to illustrate the point. So in 2000, in, sorry, in 2017 to 18, one third of students who started, uh, one third of white students who started the LPC did not go on to complete it. And that in itself seems quite high to me. But for black students, this non-completion rate doubled to two thirds. So just, just to pause there for a moment. So two thirds of black students who started the LPC in 2017 did not finish it. Now that cannot be right. So the new SQE framework it will not in itself solve these sorts of problems. But in our assessment, we thought that it offered, what it does do is offer huge potential to advance our understanding of differential attainment and how best to tackle it. So during our assessment, the SRA committed to obtaining independent research into the underlying reasons for differential attainment across legal services, professional 
assessment. I think, uh, I think they've confirmed that they've started the process for commissioning this and are aiming to publish the findings uh, later in 2021. In due course, uh, once it's, the assessments are all up and running, uh, the SRA will also be publishing annual SQE assessment data, which will include reporting on the correlation between performance and protected characteristics. So taking things back to the subject of this discussion, in my mind, one clear way that law courses can, pr can prove their value is by grasping the opportunity to use this new research and data as it becomes available to develop approaches that improve and ways of teaching and delivering courses that improve rather than exacerbate differential attainment. In developing the SQE, the SRA also commissioned the independent bridge group to assess the diversity impacts of the new framework. And the bridge group's conclusion really struck a chord with me. The bridge group concluded that whilst the SQE framework created the opportunity for significant progress, on increasing diversity in the profession. There would only be modest gains without employers and training providers making the most of these opportunities. So in conclusion, all of us involved in the legal sector share a mission to improve diversity and inclusion across the legal professions. We have a new framework coming in, which could provide a powerful tool for progressing this mission but only if we can embrace the opportunities that it presents to look at and to do things differently. If law schools can play their part in this, they really will be adding value to the sector and to wider society. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Chris. And thank you all the panelists for giving those short talks and we'll dive straight into some of the questions. And I would just like to open with a general question and it's it's kind of like how do universities know what to add to their law courses you know particularly their llbs you know there's so much options now is, is it sqe prep is it mental health is it tech you know is it enhanced research it's already been mentioned or is it kind of international elements international courses or as paul mentioned in his talk about employability and that kind of support and so that, that that's my question maybe tom you could kick us off on that one what what's the kind of thought process there Thanks, Tom. So um, I think that, uh, of course, there's all those things that we ought to ought to do, but then how do we get our information? One thing is to uh, regularly consult with students themselves. So rather than assuming we know what they want from their program to engage and not just in the National Student Survey, but in uh, more robust and, I dare I say, it, more informal uh, uh, settings, I think you often get a lot more information from people than, than tick boxes and questionnaires. That, that's one kind of important thing. Um, the other uh, thing, of course, is also to have a regard, uh, not to be, not to give it a veto necessarily, but have a regard for the academic excellence of research that are happening by colleagues as well. Have a steer from what is the school uh, school strengths, um, you know, where uh, and and to think about uh, where its positioning uh, is and where it could be. And then finally, and for me, the the one of the the biggest and and can I say this most fun. Uh, thing to do was to get on the road. When I told my uh, my colleagues, if you have me as dean, you're going to you know, an American as dean, you're getting the American dean uh, way of doing it. I was not going to sit on my backside. No one's doing this in the room. But I was not going to sit in my backside, plopped in my office, and you know, reflecting on workload models. I was going to be going to law firms across the country. I was going to go to law firms outside this country. I was going to speak to the alumni. I was going to speak to them on the bench speak to them in the, in the chambers, speak to them in the firms, and speak to those who don't practice law. I was going to go to them and find out from them as well uh, where things are and what we should be doing. Often a lot of that conversation was correcting misperceptions about how what the teaching was, <laughs> what we are offering. They were surprised to hear we still had small group tutorials like we did 50 years ago, we still do, um, and, and all the rest of it. So it's really quite good, but also then seeing myself firsthand what people actually do at the coal face, find out myself how many, what their records are of how many of my students they've got. You know, Durham's been second, third best most years in uh, on, on the number of students getting uh, trainee jobs uh, in London. You know, what are the numbers of the firm? How are they doing? What has happened next? Not speculation, not from the newspaper, uh, the legal cheek always telling us the truth, but but from the from the horse's mouth. Uh, so to speak. And that's been great. And it's something I think a lot of us don't do enough. That's to start us off. 
Thanks for that, Tom. And Matt, could I just ask you the same question from ULAW's perspective? So I suppose if I firstly talk about our own LLB and obviously how we've we've built that program, which has been very much focused on our teaching methodology, um, which has been practice centered. So it's been preparing that LLB student for the world of work from the moment they, they arrive um, with us. So they have got the benefit of, uh, I suppose, um, applying law to kind of real life facts. Um, they're taught in, you know, small workshop groups, employability is embedded within the, the curriculum um, throughout. And, you know, when I've obviously in my presentation talked about how um, I suppose universities um, consider what they do next in, in the kind of era of SQE. You know, I fully acknowledge that there are programmes that are well, I suppose, suited and well built to obviously um, absorb in that kind of SQE preparation content um, within them. Um, but, you know, to my mind, the um, legal market has changed so dramatically to a point where the, I, th I suppose, kind of, you know, raw core skills of, of, of being a lawyer um, are, you know, perceived as, as being, you know, so, so important that actually, I think for a programme to, to be worth its salt, you know, that's got to be something which is, um, you know, embedded throughout it. So, you know, the, the employability piece um, being particularly important as well. Thanks very much, Matthew. Christopher, if I could just bring you in in the conversation here, and I, I just wanted to pick up on something you mentioned, which was quite interesting and piqued my interest. And you were saying about how during uncertain times, you know, students flock to vocational courses. One of the more popular ones is law. But then you, you mentioned that, for, you know, obviously there's a huge amount of competition among law courses and law schools need to be sure to be putting employability at the heart of their courses. I just want to explore that very quickly. And, First of all, what do you mean by that and how, how can law schools do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think it's a little vulgar, but the best measure is in employment outcomes. And you know, there's a reason that those matter. There's a reason they're increasing in salience in the rankings and that students look for that. You know, it wasn't so long ago that I was going to university myself and it, it's an important factor. Um, and it's hard to gain, right? If, if, you're, if you're doing good work and people are getting good employment outcomes, then there's, there's something working there. Um, but what does it actually mean? Um, I, the two things, the recommendations I was going to make. Number one, it has to be employer centric. You need to talk to employers about what they want. Um, we do that, obviously, a lot of lectures next. And I think the things we find is flexible intellect, some, you know, intellect that you can apply to multiple different scenarios, teachable intellect is, is first and foremost. Um, but also really solid core legal doing skills. So the things that you're doing day to day, the higher the benchmark of skills that you come in with in, on day one, the better. And that's where I think the competition is going to come from. And Chris talked really powerfully about how we hope that the SQE is going to lower those barriers to entry in the profession. And, and I really hope that that means some of those people who've been working as non-qualified lawyers, and perhaps as paralegals, researchers, will finally be able to you know, become, become qualified lawyers. What that means for, for students who are, who are studying, it, that that employment pool is that much more competitive the second recommendation to provide is, is I think they need to experiment. There's not going to be one answer. There's no you know, one play that they can follow. It needs to take more risks, try out more things. They're not all going to pay off. Share expertise and look at what other you know, good pockets of good practice and other providers and try and greedily steal that. And we actually held an event a couple of weeks ago at LexisNexis where we did a round table on what the future of employability looks like to try and find those opportunities to share ideas with colleagues and eventually that will have that impact on those employment outcomes. Thanks for that, Chris. And Paul, if I could pass that question across to you in terms of, you know, Chris has stressed the importance of employability and putting it at the centre of the courses as, you know, the University of Birmingham Law School's Director of Careers and Employability. How, how are you actually doing that on the ground? Yeah, I completely agree with Christopher's comments and, and it's something I spend a lot of time doing every day. But that employer-centric approach is key. So being in regular contact with the key employers that we know are interested in our students, just looking through the list of attendees here. There, there's numerous people who I've spoken to in the last year about the, the pathway of Birmingham students into their firms and particular ways in which we can better support our students. And, and I think that overall understanding of the, the roles our students are applying for and how we can better support them to achieve their goals is, is really essential. So it's continual communication with students, employers, and looking at the data as well. To, to give you one illustration, picking up on what Chris was saying about um, the diversity elements, we 
equally have picked up on some of the barriers being faced by black students and we've just launched a black talent in law program with a leading law firm having looked at some of the data and established the need for additional financial and also careers mentoring support for our black students at Birmingham Law School who, who form about 15 percent of our student body so overall I'd say it's about networking speaking to people and then acting on the the information that we find thanks for that paul we've got a question in the the, the sidebar here from uh, christa richmond and i was wondering chris nichols maybe maybe you could have a stab at this one is that will will the increasing focus on the sqe reduce the provision of qualifying law degrees in other words will students have to make their career choice whether it be a solicitor or a barrister much earlier do you have a view on that yeah, I mean, it, it's something that we looked at when we when we assessed the SQ application. It, it it is possible, I think. I think it depends how the market reacts. I mean, I, I hope that that's not uh, one of the byproducts, but I, th I don't think we can rule it out. But it but it also depends. You know, the SRA has taken this action, and overall, I think it's the right move, and for, for the reasons I said, creates a lot of potential for innovation and change in a market that I think for various reasons could benefit from that. If it starts to have that impact, then I think the pressure will be on the Bar Standards Board to consider its approach and whether it still needs a qualifying law degree. So, so, so it, yes, that may happen. I hope it doesn't. If it does, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to choose earlier. It just might increase pressure on, on others to consider their position. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, Elizabeth, if I could come to you, you know, obviously you, you've been very vocal. Like, obviously, I follow you on Twitter and we've, you've <laughs> been documenting about how, you know, training in junior law and mental health has deteriorated under lockdown. And to a certain extent, the same can be said for law students, you know, working remotely in the confines of their, their homes. And I'm just thinking in light of this, do you foresee um, a greater focus on mental health built into law courses going forwards? or perhaps even to the extent where we will see a, a compulsory mental health module in an LLB one day? Interesting question. Um, I think it would be great to have programming that's around understanding your psychology. So for example, in Ireland, the, in the Law Society of Ireland still run the um, solicitor's training course. They run a program called Shrink Me, I'm a Lawyer. And it's all about understanding psychology, how your mind works, how you approach things, um, sort of that sort of analysis of thinking styles, how how to recognize unhealthy thinking styles and starting to embed that into helping future lawyers see that part of their professional practice and their professional identity should be a recognition that their mental health is so important because at the end of the day, law is a people business. The work that lawyers do happens in their minds. Your mind is your greatest asset as a lawyer. You need clarity of focus and concentration in order to be a good lawyer. If your mental health is impaired, you are less likely to have that capacity to apply your best legal mind. And you're also more likely to make a mistake or a poor ethical decision if your mental health and well-being is compromised. So I think teaching it in a positive way about how this is part of your skill set, looking after your mind, I think could be an, a really important part of an undergraduate and law school program. And I know that some law schools are beginning to add that kind of thing into the curriculum, certainly in other jurisdictions.